name is Kat. My name is Haley. And I'm Kobe. And welcome to the, the Couch, Couch Potato, Potato Lab. Lab. The show where we bring science to your home. Now, thank you for joining us here today for season three of the Couch Potato Lab and a happy Pride Month to everyone. Reminder that you can find today's lab manual on our blog or you can head over to BIT back or bit.ly backslash Couch Potato Lab to find the lab manual and you can gather your supplies. You can also text us uh, during the show at 306 570 1013 or tweet us, us using the hashtag Couch Potato Lab. Now, let's meet our scientists here with us today. Awesome, my name is Haley. My pronouns are she, her, and I have a fun fact for everyone. I, it's not really a fun fact. I've been working on it all weekend. I want everyone to see it. Hopefully we could see it if I come in front here. And so I have these old pair of white shoes and since it's Pride Month, I thought I'd paint them to be the pride flag. Let's see if I can get it in the frame here. Wow. wow. <laughs> so yeah, I worked really hard on them. So that's my fun fact for everybody. Nicely Very impressive. Done. And as I said, my name is Kat. My pronouns are she, her. And a fun fact about me is my favorite boat is the kayak. I love kayaking, especially now that we're getting into nicer weather. I really miss kayaking. And Kobe? <laughs> Hello, my name is Kobe. My pronouns are he and him. Um, today we're going to play a really cool game which involves uh, me using chopsticks. And fun fact, I actually don't know how to properly use chopsticks. And it's been 22 years and I still don't know. So you can maybe tweet me on how to, maybe the instructions on how to actually properly use chopsticks because I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we'll get to learn today. <laughs> now, as I said earlier, it's really nice outside. And I've noticed that the weather's been changing and things are changing outside. And I swear that I used to see all these rabbits running around and they were white, like super white. But now some of them are white, some of them are brown. Haley, do you know why that would happen right now? Well, the rabbits that I see are actually on Treaty 4 territory. And that's where the Couch Potato Lab and Eyes operates from. Treaty 4 territory is the traditional homeland of the Nehawak, Nakawe, Dakota, Nakota, and the Lakota peoples, and the traditional homeland of the Métis, Michif Nation. We're so happy to be on this land and be sharing it with these wonderful people, and we encourage you at home to go out and find out what territory you might be on right now, or unceded territory. That means it doesn't have a treaty number assigned to it. So tweet us what you're on, tweet us where you're from, we want to hear it all. But anyways, back to the <laughs> rabbits. rabbits. These <laughs> rabbits, they're all, they're all brown, and I swear they were just white, Haley. I know. Well, something else happened, too, in our habitats and our ecosystems here. The snow melted, and snow is white. So when there's white on the ground, the rabbits will turn white. And so that's an adaptation. And an adaptation is when an animal will adapt to its surroundings so that it can survive better. Imagine if we could just see a brown rabbit running across the snow. They'd be a very easy target for a predator. Ooh, dun, dun, dun. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. So it's an adaptation. So it's a change that animals may go through to better survive in their environments. Would you say that's about right? That is right. And rabbits are not the only ones who have adaptations. There are adaptations in so many other animals, like starfish, if they get their arm cut off, they grow a new one. Or what are some other ones, Kobe? Um, th some other ones would be like skunks, right? So if they see a predator, they might um, blow some stinky smells <laughs> to, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that the predators run away or something like that. But today, I think we're going to focus on an adaptation that many marine animals or cetaceans have, um, and it's called blubber. And blubber is like a big, thick layer of fat that um, marine animals have to keep warm. So they have about like three different roles. One of them is to like store energy. Another one is to insulate um, heat. And the last one is to maintain their buoyancy. So if you're interested in buoyancy, because that's a really big word, check out our very, very first episode where we talk about buoyancy and how to make um, li like divers float or stay neutrally buoyant. But anyways, back to blubber. Um, I know that there are many marine animals that have blubber. Kat, do you, can you list any examples of animals that might have blubber? 
I think that seals have blubber, and I also think that whales would have lots of bl blubber, especially because when I think about seals and whales, um, they often, they travel a lot in different water that's really, really cold so that they would have to stay warmer so that the blubber would help them stay warm. Yes, you are correct. Awesome. So yeah, so ex um, animals like those would have blubber because they are in like really cold and icy water environments. So they have to rely on their blubber to insulate that heat and trap that heat to make sure that the heat doesn't escape and so that they can conserve and stay warm in that really, really cold environment. And um, another fun fact is that, Kat, do you think that blubber and our fat is the same thing? I think so, because my my body fat helps keep me warm, so <laughs> wouldn't that be the same thing? Uh, sort of. So yes, they're both fat, blubber and fat um, on humans are kind of similar, but what's different about blubber is that it's more dense, It has it's, more, it's thicker, and it has a lot of um, blood vessels around it. So that I think that's like the most like the distinguishing part of what blubber is is the multiple and lots of blood vessels around. And what happens is that when it's in deep waters, um, the blood vessels constrict. And Kat, do you know what constrict means? Because that's a big word. I think I've heard that word before. I think constrict means that it gets smaller, or tighter. Yes, very very good. So the blood vessels constrict in cold water, and it reduces the blood flow. Blood flow. So because of that, um, energy is like kind of like conserved or like saved so that they can save that energy um, for later on and to maintain that body temperature. Since they're warm-blooded animals like us that we have to like kind of maintain our internal temperature. And yeah, so uh, that's what blubber is. And I think we're going to do an activity with um, how to like demonstrate that blubber. So Kat, what, what are we going to do today? So thank you for that amazing explanation of blubber, Kobe, and sorting that out. So now I know that my human fat is not the same <laughs> as blubber. Um, so the materials that you're going to need today, um, once again, if you need them, you can f uh, find our lab manual at bit.ly front slash couch potato lab. So you will need a vessel that can hold water. And we also have ice in this water to make it really cold. Uh, we have two sandwich bags. And then we also have some shortening. Now, if you don't have shortening at home, you can also use um, peanut butter, butter, margarine. Get creative. Let us know what you are going to use for your material. And then some of us also have a thermometer that we're going to test out uh, our science of lever with. Ooh, all right. All right. So, uh, Haley, would you like to tell us what you're going to do with your uh, shortening? Of course. So I have a thermometer, and luckily I didn't draw the short end of the stick. I won't be covering my hands in shortening today. <laughs> I'll just be using this thermometer and just testing to see what temperature it's actually going to be once I cover this whole end in the shortening and dip it in cold water. Will the temperature get really cold? Will it stay the same? We will see. Mm, sh uh, so are, we, are, you, are you planning to do like an initial temperature check and then a final um, um, temperature check? You are correct. So I will test out our temperature right now. It should be pretty cold. Oh my goodness. It's at about 11 degrees. So it's Ooh. not cold, cold, but it's pretty cold as far as water goes, because water normally sits at about room temperature, unless you put it in the fridge or the microwave. Oh, okay, so not water that you'd want to take a bath in necessarily. No, <laughs> no way, Jose. Cold so showers are the way to go, though. <laughs> so good for you. <laughs> Early in the morning? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be covering this end in our shortening here, just to see if our temperature stays the same at 11 degrees or if it gets any colder or warmer. So I'm gonna just stick this right in. <laughs> <laughs> this works perfect. And I can keep my hands nice and clean. Looks like a popsicle. It does look like a popsicle, although I don't think I'd want to. Want Wouldn't to be very this. tasty, yeah. that's for sure. Yes, yes. So uh, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen, Kat? Well, because of what Kobe explained about blubber, I believe that this shortening might act like um, an insulator the same way that blubber does for animals. So I think that it will help keep the thermometer warm. 
what do you think might happen, Kobe? What's your hypothesis? Um, I 100% agree with you, and yes, lock in my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, well, let's test it out. Can we count down from three, two, two one? one. <laughs> oh, I'm very scared this is going to fall off. <laughs> okay. Alright, let's just let it get used to it. Wow. It actually kind of floats a little bit, so that might be... It's cool. buoyant. It's buoyant. <laughs> that is exactly what I was looking for. Oh, and we got a temperature read. Oh my goodness. It's 28 degrees, room temperature. 28 degrees. Holy. Wow. <laughs> really? So that keeps it really warm. That's awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we do have a question from the Hayes brothers. Um, they are wondering, can blubber rip or break? Kobe, do you know anything about that? Um, not. I'm not quite too sure. I know that um, some hunters, when they hunt on whales, um, they usually have to take off that blubber to like rip it apart and separate it from the meat and the blubber. So I feel like blubber is more like kind of like a whole bunch of fat tissues, right? Um, so because it's a tissue and it's an organ, um, skin cells might be, be able to regenerate just a little bit. So I would say yes. I'm not quite too sure about that, but I would say yes. Yeah, that's my educational guess, my hypothesis. Right. Good question, though. Thank you, Hayes Brothers. <coughs> uh, and now, Kobe, what are you going to be doing with your shortening? Okay, well, the thing is, I'm not as fancy as Haley, so I'm, instead of using a thermometer, I'm going to use my finger. I'm going to dip it in and say if it's cold or hot. <laughs> Ready, all right. Oh, so cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, don't hold it in there too long. <laughs> Not too long. Make sure your parents are nearby. Parental supervision, very good. All right, Kat, what are you going to do? Are you going to do the same thing as me? Yes, I'm ready. I think I think mine is going to be pretty cold too. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yeah. Yep, that's way too cold. Ooh. All right, so um, we're going to kind of test out the purpose of using... Um, this shortening and wrap it. I'm going to wrap it around my finger. What are you going to do, Kat? I personally want to keep my hands nice and clean. So what I've done is I've placed my shortening in a bag, and I'm going to place my hand, <laughs> this clean hand, in the bag, and then place this bag in here and mold the shortening around my hand. Oh. And then I'll stick it in the water. <laughs> Well, I decided to get real uh, messy, and this is my beautiful finger now. Uh, yes, looking good. All right, Kat, are you ready? I'm <laughs> ready. Dip it into the water. Three, two, two one. one. Wow. Okay, I don't feel anything. I at don't all. feel anything at all either. Uh, my uh, finger is maintaining a body temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Mine and as well. Yes. I think this shortening works really well as yeah. an insulator to keep mm -hmm. us nice and warm. Yeah, because like shortening is uh, made out of fat, right? So kind of similar to blubber. And because of that, it might be able to insulate or trap the warm air um, inside so that our fingers stays nice and warm. Yeah. So look at that. I'm going to clean up now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that was amazing. I'm glad that now I understand the science of blubber a bit more. And I know we talked about some different animals that uh, use blubber to keep warm. For example, seals. Now, for this next um, experiment we're going to do, I have given Kobe and Haley a nice hot pack. And these hot packs represent an animal. So Haley's animal is going to be a polar bear. And Kobe's animal is going to be a seal. And their job is to keep their hot packs nice and warm. And then we're going to submerge them into water and see if what they've created to keep their hot packs warm does its job. Similar to how we need to keep these animals warm. Exactly. So some of the materials that we'll be using today to insulate our heat packs right here are some cotton balls that might work as kind of like a blubber substitute. We also have some sponges and that might help with that buoyancy aspect that Kovi was mentioning earlier. And we have some aluminum foil and some foam sheets of paper because foam is kind of spongy and I imagine that blubber would feel uh, pretty spongy. 
Do you say so, cat? I would imagine because, you know, if I if I can feel my own body fat, it feels nice and soft um, and uh, pliable. I can feel <laughs> it. <laughs> um, so I would imagine even though human fat and animal blubber are not the same thing, that they would be similar in that way. Now, Kobe, have you found your seal? Yes, this is my beautiful seal fat. This is my, this is my seal. <laughs> and... I'm going to use a variety of different things to kind of like keep this and heat pack warm. It is kind of hot, so I'm going to um, keep it on the ground. But uh, I think what we're going to do is maybe probably take the temperature of the heat pack first. And then after that, we can, when we're testing it in the ice cold water that we're going to dip it into, um, after we put the insulator on, um, we can compare the temperatures. Does this sound pretty cool, Kat? Yes, that sounds perfect. So let's test those temperatures out, those initial temperatures. So right now, our hot packs are nice and warm. So, Haley, what is the temperature of your polar bear hot pack? Oh my goodness, it is about 35 degrees. 35 degrees? Holy. Mm -hmm. Is yours any hotter hot. or colder? Uh, mine's about 32 degrees. 32 degrees. 32 degrees, yes. All right, so now, pretending that these hot heat packs are just the animal's skin and bones, basically, you need to provide these animals with warmth, with blubber-like substances to keep them warm when we submerge them into our ice-cold baths. All right, are you two ready? Yes. Yes. All right, you may begin. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I need to talk my way through this while I'm building. So I think what I'm gonna do is, I think I need like, kind of like, if I want to imitate my seal, um, seals do have a little bit of hair. So I think I'm gonna use a little bit of cotton balls to surround it. And seals also have a blubber, have fat, right? So I'm gonna use my Crisco <gasps> and make sure I beat Haley. Okay, that's a plan. I'm going to use Crisco. I'm going to beat Haley. Haley, what you doing? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I was thinking instead of hair for these cotton balls, they feel like they would be very comfy, kind of like a bed right next to our, our animal skin here. <laughs> so I'm just kind of making an envelope to kind of um, to kind of stick these inside of. So we'll, we'll see if this keeps it warm. Interesting approaches. We'll see. So Haley's initial temperature for her polar bear was 35 degrees Celsius, and Kobe's for his seal is 32 degrees Celsius. So remember those numbers because we are going to test afterwards to see how good their insulation is for their heat packs. Right. Now, just a reminder, if you wanted to um, text us at 306-570 one zero one three and let us know are there any other animal adaptations that you can think of right now or you can tweet us using hashtag couch potato lab now Haley, are there any other examples maybe right now in canada specifically that you can think of of animals using special adaptations hmm right now in canada what about i just was walking around the park the other day and i saw all these geese but i didn't see them during the winter at all where did they come from where do they go so that is a wonderful example of an adaptation called migration. So geese, you probably have noticed it too. Um, they all head south for the winter. So when it's really cold here in Saskatchewan, when we're getting, you know, minus 20, minus 30, maybe even minus 40 degrees, the geese, they don't want to be here. So they all fly, they migrate down south where it's warmer and they hang out there until the temperatures start to warm up back here in Saskatchewan. And so you may have noticed in the past months, two months even, that you'll see some Canada geese coming back and now they've found their home. Lots of them have laid eggs and have babies. Yeah. yeah. So Kobe, are there any other examples you can think of? of animals and their adaptations? Um, if we're going to talk about maybe like the polar bear again, polar bears are white, so they rely on their pelt to um, kind of camouflage in the snow as well, like the rabbits that we were talking about. And that's important for camouflaging because they want to catch the seals that they eat. Um, so they make sure that when the seals come up from um, the water, just like to breathe or something like that, the polar bear is like ready to attack. And I think, Haley, you, do you have um, something about polar bears that you wanted to talk about? I am. I'm just fact-checking myself. Hmm. 
I could be very wrong, and we will check this in tomorrow's episode, but I could have sworn that uh, polar bear fur is actually clear, and it's only reflected off the snow that turns oh, it white. Oh, really? But wow. we will... I'll do some more searching on that. I'm not quite sure if that's true. Oh, and that's a picture of a polar bear right there. It doesn't look too healthy, does it, Cat? No, this polar bear, it looks like it's probably... It's had a hard time finding food. <laughs> hmm. Well, I think that it might be having a hard time finding food because of global warming and the way that we're treating our planet. With all of the ice melting, polar bears can't go out and hunt their usual food like seals and other marine animals. And so they're having a hard time finding their food. And that's directly correlated to the things that we're doing on this planet to harm them. So I hope that we can, in the future, move to more renewable forms of energy that will help those polar bears find food and keep them from becoming extinct. Yes, and that was a wonderful photo taken by a Canadian photographer and marine biologist, Paul Nicklin. Um, he travels around and he um, tries to bring light to these changes that we're seeing w in our climate. Mm -hmm. Now, Haley, how <coughs> is your polar bear jacket coming along. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think I've just figured out the new fashion for this coming winter. Ta-da! <laughs> wow, it's reflective. It yes. is, <laughs> it is. I thought that maybe the aluminum foil wouldn't um, let any water in. So I'm really fingers crossed on that. Oh, that's, oh, that's a good idea. And Kobe, <laughs> how is your seal uh, outfit coming? Mine is great. Here is a nice um, <laughs> insulated jacket for my seal. It has some um, shortening right there uh, to represent the blubber that it has. And I have some cotton balls deep inside there to represent the little hairs on the seal. Yeah, so hopefully it maintains its temperature. So I think mine was 32. So hopefully when I dump this um, bad guy right into this ice cold water, it's going to maintain that temperature. Mm hmm. Are you ready <coughs> to go then, Kofi? Uh, yes. Yes? I'm ready to go. Me too. All right, so let's uh, remember that Haley's initial temperature was 35 degrees Celsius and Kobe's was 32 degrees Celsius. All right, Kobe, do you want to test yours first? Yes. And we'll submerge. Submerge. Oh, it's just floating. <laughs> oh, very buoyant. <laughs> oh, buoyant, buoyant, just like blubber. Buoyant. Exactly. Oh, very good. Yes. <laughs> okay, so three seconds. Is yours in as well? Um, no, I can put mine in right sure. now, though. All right. Ooh. Oh, mine's floating, too. We'll see if we can <laughs> submerge it. We'll submerge. We have another great question here. Do only geese migrate? No. There's, I know there's, like, um, like land animals that have to migrate as well, and lots of other birds migrate. I don't have a good example. I think deer. Deer migrate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, deer, deer migrate. Deer migrate, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so like maybe um, um, if a uh, area or a habitat is scarce of food, they might have to migrate so they can find another food source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be another reason why um, animals migrate. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you say, Kobe? Should we bring these out? We oui, we. Oui. All right. Oh, mine feels very heavy and I can just <laughs> see the water. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> wow. What a great polar bear jacket. Uh, Kobe, are you making fun of my polar bear of jacket? Of course not, Haley. Oh, good. <laughs> I wouldn't want any friends to make fun of me. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to test these final yes. temperatures? All right, Kobe. So yours was 32 degrees Celsius to be in. What is yours now? Uh, mine dropped, unfortunately. It is now 28 degrees Celsius. Wow. So only, only a four degree drop. Not too bad, but I don't know if that seal would survive. Maybe oh not. No. All right. No. Haley. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Haley, what's the temperature of your polar bear? Mine is 14 degrees. 14? Oh, 14 oh my gosh. Degrees. <laughs> what? <laughs> so what is that? A 21 degree drop? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had a very good design. So maybe, I know Kobe, He his secret ingredient, do you want to reveal that once more? What yeah, was it was a shortening. So I used a little bit of shortening to like insulate that heat or trap that heat um, in the heat pack so it wouldn't um, let release that heat as much. So maybe that's a little bit different than Haley's where majority of her heat uh, left and that wasn't well insulated. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm very sad, but I think I'll beat you on the next activity. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> oh, and we, we just got word that, Haley, your hunch was in fact correct, that most sources do say that polar bear hair is in fact transparent or clear, and the uh -huh. air spaces reflect the light and scatter it, and that's why it appears white. Oh my goodness, who knew? So it's not white fur? What? Exactly. Okay, so maybe wait, so maybe if polar bear's hair is like um, reflective, is the rabbit hair reflective as well then? I think we'd have to look into that. Oh wait, no, because nope. like it would like it changes, it changes color then, right? The rabbit's well, pelt could, changes color. Mm -hmm. Could it go from brown to clear? <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> wow, the real question. Yes, hey. the <laughs> How do rabbits grow their hair? <laughs> we'll have to check back with that. So that was a really cool <coughs> adaptation that we learned about, um, about blubber and how we can keep these animals that survive in cold climates warm. Now, Kobe, do you have any other animal adaptations that we could learn about? Mm, other animal adaptations. Um, I think we're going to talk about a little bit about birds later on, but I know that some birds... Oh, oh, oh penguins. Penguins. Okay, let's talk <laughs> about penguins for like two <laughs> seconds. Okay, penguins, um, they don't have um, like, like, um, like, I don't know, like feathers to keep them warm or like hair and stuff like that. So how they keep warm is that they kind of like huddle up all together with all their friends and family and like stay warm all together when they're giving wow. each other a little hug. <laughs> wow, I remember doing that in elementary school when it was very cold, but not quite cold enough to have an indoor recess. <laughs> Being in grade seven or eight and we would all just huddle together <laughs> in the warmest corner. So that's what penguins do, you're saying? Yes, exactly, just like that. Wow. Le and penguins don't always, um, not just penguins huddle up to keep warm. Other a um, plants kind of like do the same thing where they grow together in clumps to stay warm, in t especially in like areas in like the tundra area where it's like super, super cold and lots of snow or like permafrost happens. So they kind of grow together to stay warm, kind of like what penguins do when they huddle together. Yeah. Awesome. And we have a wonderful question from Rhythm. If only marine animals have blubber, what do animals that live above water have? Animals that live above water would have fat, like us. We would have fat. So remember the difference between blubber and fat is that blubber is more thick, right? There's more thick so they can calm, um, store a lot more energy. And another big difference is that there's a lot more blood vessels around the blubber. And animals have like, like fat. Some animals have um, heavy pelts or like hair to stay warm as well yeah yeah so for example when you think about bears bears go into hibernation and before they go into hibernation they eat a bunch of food because when they're sleeping for those months on end in the really cold winter their body uses that stored up fat as energy so when they come out of hibernating they're actually a lot smaller than when they came in but it's because their body was using all that fat and energy that they had stored up and then also when you think about something like elks, have you ever seen elks outside and kind of as they get into springtime, their, their fur kind of looks ratty and scratchy. Have you seen that before? Ratty and scratchy? Yeah. No. That's, that's them shedding their winter coat oh. so they can stay nice and cool for the summertime. Ooh, kind of like snakes when they shed their skin. I don't know if snakes <laughs> shed their skin for <laughs> heat purposes, <laughs> but, yeah, but interesting. <laughs> yes, yes. I suppose that would be another animal adaptation if we're thinking in broader terms. Yes. I yeah. know that like warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals like stay warm differently as well. Um, I think warm, warm-blooded animals have to maintain their internal temperature. So ours is 37 degrees, so we have to maintain that temperature. But cold-blooded animals, like a snake, for example, like what Haley said, um, might rely are cold-blooded, so they have to rely on their outside environment to stay warm and cold. So, for example, <laughs> like if a snake needs to uh, stay warm, they might um, go to a rock, rock where the sun is shining to get that heat energy up. And if they want to cool down, they go back into like the soil or something like that or the dirt to, to stay cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Now, <coughs> I see a bunch of different birds flying around, and I would really like to know more about why do they all look different? 
why do I see some um, birds that, you know, like the hummingbird that has a beautiful long beak, but then you'll have birds like pelicans that have this massive beak that can swallow a bunch of water. Kobe, do you know anything about these different bird beaks? Yes, I do know a lot about these different bird beaks, but before we get into that, I think um, a better way to like, explain these different types of bird beaks is to play a game. And I have brought a game for all of us to play, but I'm going to be honest, um, this game is, might be a little bit boring if it's just the three of us. I know you two are like super great and all, but like we need a little pizzazz. A pizzazz? <laughs> a little pizzazz. You know what? I think I know just the right person to invite if we're talking pizzazz. <laughs> Vanessa, would you like to come join us? Vanessa, yes. hello. Woo! Hello, hello. But yes, as they said, my name is Vanessa. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and a fun fact about me, since we're talking so much about animals, um, I have two cats at home, and one of them is 17 years old. <gasps> wow. <laughs> isn't, that, oh my God. isn't that like 130 <laughs> in human years? I think it might be, so even older than some of the viewers at home. Wow. Oh my gosh. Maybe your cat has like nine lives. Maybe. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be it. What are your cat's names? Uh, the older one is Trixie, and then the younger one, he's not that young, though. He's 14. Uh, his name is Gizmo. <laughs> Gizmo! <laughs> yes, I classic love that. cat names. Oh my gosh, they're real old. <laughs> <laughs> they are. All right, so how to play this game is that we're going to... Um, each, each bird beak is going to be represented by like a tool. So what I'm going to use today is chopsticks. Um, Kat, what are you going to use today? I am am a big fan of birds of prey so i have a skewer and i think the skewer might represent like an eagle because it's so sharp <laughs> Haley. oh my goodness well all the sunshine has me thinking about the beach and maybe some animals that might be at the beach so i'm gonna be using a clothespin that's kind of like a pelican that can swoop down and just kind of grab things up Ooh, and um, Vanessa, what are you going to use today? I have some tongs. They're very large. I don't know what kind of, are there any super big birds out there? Like, what's bigger than a pelican? Hmm. Mm. I was thinking of maybe a flamingo. Ooh, yes, I'm a flamingo. Flamingo? Very good. Nice, nice, awesome. nice. So what's going to happen is that um, each table is kind of like an island. And uh, the specific birds have finally migrated to this island because the, um, they're kind of preparing for the winter and they need to get a lot of food. And they feel like the islands they're at, they're able to get a lot of food and get ready for winter. So what's going to happen is that um, here, this plastic cup will represent our nest. Um, and we're going to have 30 second rounds where we kind of try to pick up as many food um, items in and put them into our nest to get ready for winter. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yes. So you guys can play along as well. So you can just pretty much grab any food particles you want, maybe grab something like something really, really difficult to use, like chopsticks, for example, or, or, <laughs> or a, a skewer that's like really, really pointy, something like that. So, Kobe, I, I have one question. What's your question? Can I eat this? Uh, <laughs> no, don't no. eat science. Uh. We're not going to eat it, but if you guys would like, you guys can eat yours. Um, just make sure that you wash your hands and make sure everything is clean. All <laughs> yes. right. All right, so I think we're going to put 30 seconds on the timer. And the first round we're going to do is this bowl with gummy worms and marshmallows. Mm. Yes. All righty. Oh, ready? they look so good. I just want to eat them all. <laughs> and let's make a little distance between the, our food and our nest because birds have to uh, um, move around and try to like scavenge and forage for food. So let's do like maybe like two hands. Two hands? Two hands oh my apart, goodness. if possible. Something like that, or like a hand, if if you're Vanessa and you're in a tiny, Table's tiny island. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <clears throat> 30 seconds on. I'm ready with my predatory okay. bird beak. Bird beak, are you ready? Get set, go. Oh. Does it have to be one at a time, or can I use I my tongs? Well, <laughs> if your tongs are able to pick them all up, my, that my skewer your <laughs> won't let go of this marshmallow. There we go. 15 seconds. Oh, no. 15. Oh, no. no. <laughs> These marshmallows keep sticking to the skewer. <laughs> well, I just got like seven. <laughs> Oh, oh. Two oh, seconds. No. Oh. So One stuck. and stop. No. Hands up. 
Perfect. Okay, let's let's reflect. <laughs> so Haley, <laughs> how much food did you get for your nest? Uh, I got twelve, but I found the most difficult to pick up were the gummy worms, which is why I only have one. You only have one. So maybe your beak is more adapted to get um, small things like the marshmallows, but really hard, it's hard, difficult to grab bigger things like the worms. Exactly. Mm, okay. All right, Vanessa, how did you do? The tongs wow. did very, very well. We <laughs> <laughs> got it all. So, yeah, I'm pretty proud of the tongs. Um, can scoop up quite a lot at the same time, which is why once I got through the layers of marshmallows, I was I got all the gummy worms at the exact same time. So, pretty proud of them. Wow, what a versatile wow. beak. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Kat, how did you do? Well. The skewer was did a pretty good job. The only issue is that the marshmallows just yeah. stuck to the skewer. <laughs> so I only have a, a measly four <laughs> marshmallows in the cup, but I have three on the skewer, if that <laughs> counts for anything. Sure, why not? <laughs> And Kobe, what were your results? Um, I think I did pretty well. I got like two gummy worms and I got like 10 marshmallows. So like chopsticks is pretty good pretty as a good. beak. Yeah. yeah, I don't think you're that bad at using chopsticks. No, okay, so okay, what what I'm doing wrong is that you're supposed to move like the top point of the uh, of the chopsticks or something like that. That's what I know. That's all I know. Properly, if you're using it properly. And what I do, I don't use, I don't move the top, but I move the bottom <laughs> like this. Wow. So that is wrong. Can we get a live <laughs> demonstration? I just, I just need to see okay, live ready. action. Ooh, I'm picking up the gummy worm and placing it down. Yeah, Very impressive. nicely done. So I would say that my chop chopsticks is like well adapted. Maybe I'll kind of like pretty well. It's adapted pretty well to the foods that it needs to get and to survive for winter. How about you, Cat? Do you think your beak is adapted to <laughs> those specific foods? I mean, if if the marshmallows hadn't stuck <laughs> to the skewer, I think it's pr it did pretty well. I didn't try to go for any gummy worms because I got very distracted <laughs> by the marshmallow issue, but I still think it was it, it did a really good job. At one point, I had seven mini marshmallows <laughs> loaded on this skewer. And Haley, what do you think about your clothespin? Was it well adapted? Uh, it was pretty good. I think we could do better, though. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> and Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to trying out the next challenge. Yeah. It's going to be good. <clears throat> All right, so the next challenge uh, <laughs> is uh, our next bowl has graham crackers in it and <laughs> some gummy bears at the bottom. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I don't know how you're going to pick up the graham crackers, Kat. <laughs> so good luck with if that. There, if there is a will, there is a way, and I am certainly <laughs> determined. Yes, and you know what, Kat? There's little holes in here, so you might be able I'm to ooh. to stick your skewer to through skewer those it. holes. Yeah. Yeah. Skewer it and get it in the cup, <clears throat> hopefully. <laughs> All right, are we ready? Yes. yes. All right, 30 seconds in three, two, one, start. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to beat you. <laughs> I'm going to beat you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Oh, I finally got to the gummy bears. 17 <laughs> seconds. Oh, just now? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 10 seconds. And five seconds. Five, four, oh. three, two, one. Hands oh, up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, <laughs> that certainly went a lot better across the board, it looks uh, like. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, Kobe, let's start with you this time. All How right. did yours work out? Um, I think I did pretty darn well. So uh, there only there was one gummy bear left that I couldn't get, but I got everything else into my nest. So I would say that if this if the chopsticks was a bird, it would be ready for the f um, for winter time. Yes. Awesome. And um, Kat, how about you? Well, I'm, you know, I may have not done as well as my competitors, but I am very proud <laughs> about the progress we made. <laughs> I got all of my crackers into my cup pretty easily, and I have, I only got two gummy worms in, but you know what, that's a lot better than having the 40 marshmallows left over that I did last time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty happy, you know. It skewered the, these crackers really, really well, and I was getting to the, the gummy bears but similar issue that they just c kind of were sticking onto my skewer a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Haley, how did yours turn out? 
Oh my goodness. Well, better than the last one. I found that it was very easy to pick up the graham crackers. I could just close pin onto them and then get them to my nest. Um, I had a, some difficulty with the gummy bears again. I think it's because they're so soft, just like the marshmallows. But I think I would have lived quite well on this island if I was a bird. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And Vanessa. Wow. wow. <laughs> no shocker here. I got them all. Uh, <laughs> uh, I even had time. I accidentally, because they're so the tongs are so big, so sometimes the food would catapult out of the jar. But <coughs> one of the gummy bears fell off of the table. I had time to go around and, wow. <laughs> and get it, put it back, and then, then we were at about five seconds left. So <laughs> I was wow. just waiting so around. So Vanessa dominated. Very well adapted her, her, to this her island. Bird, her bird is would dominate these habitats and these environments. I'm I'm afraid maybe it would become an invasive bird if it's doing <laughs> this well. Oh, uh oh, it might. Be. Yeah. Um. So I know that there's uh, for environments and ecosystems. There's a lot a uh, talk about like um. Um, ad adaptation where um, birds would have like different beaks to adapt to their environment to pick up food. So for example, flamingos have like a filter kind of filter like um, beak where they filter out um, water, right? Because many of their um, prey lives in the water so they kind of like pick them up, filter out, separate the water from the, the good stuff and it eats it all. So there's different stuff like that. And I know that hummingbirds, um, they don't they don't they kind of like suck up nectar not really they kind of draw it up the nectar they have really really s um, thin um, beaks that that they're able to insert into flowers and then kind of draw up the nectar so that they can drink it yeah so like different beaks like that but another word is like natural selection and I kind of kind of forgot what natural selection is um, does anyone know by chance <sighs> no idea no idea but you know what we talked about pizzazz earlier, <laughs> and this is the kind of pizzazz answer that I think Vanessa would have. <laughs> well, thank you. I think you might be right. I studied up on this very hard. I knew I'd be coming on for an intense <coughs> game show, so I'm ready. Yeah, so my tongs over on this island did very well, dominated. If I was going to invite somebody else to my island, like Kat, for example, with her skewer, she did pretty well with like the graham crackers, was it? Yeah. Yeah, graham crackers went great. But for me, I'm also eating the graham crackers. I'm eating everything. I've got gummy bears, marshmallows, lots of food choices for me. So I am able to grow big. I can grow strong. I live a long time. If Kat comes to my island, she's then competing with me. So we're trying to eat the same stuff. Graham crackers um, and the other things she gets a little bit of, but mostly the graham crackers. So yeah. if her main food source is graham crackers, I'm also eating that and I'm going to get most of the food. Throughout time, when I'm growing big, when I'm growing strong and I'm living a long time, I'm able to have a lot of kids. My kids are going to get my beak. And then Kat's also going to probably have some kids, and her kids are going to get her beak. So over time, the more, since I'm having more kids, there's going to be a lot of kids with beaks like mine. So they're going to be able to eat a lot. And throughout time, since my kids get the most food, uh, they're going to be the top dogs of the island, <laughs> and <laughs> wow. they're going to eat everything, and that's eventually just going to be the main beak on the island. So, yeah, that's basically how that works. That drives evolution. Wow. So, pretty cool. That's how all of the adaptations get uh, stuck in the genetics and in the, in the species. So. so, even though our beaks were kind of similar, yours was better equipped to survive in our habitat. Exactly, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm able to scoop up so much with my tongs and it works really well and you can do your best, but I'm always gonna get more food and then I will be just alive for longer. So <laughs> it's just, wow. how it, just how so it goes. So my, 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 my <laughs> offspring, all my skewer <laughs> bird offspring are going to perish on this island. Wow. Not enough food, very now, sad. You said an interesting word, evolution. Does that happen like in a week? Or does it happen like in a million years? Mm, or it, it really depends. It takes a long time for um, species to evolve because it goes through generations. So you have to have lots of grandchildren, great grandchildren, great 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 grandchildren, and then you might start to see some changes because there's so many um, so many generations going on. So sometimes it takes a while. So sometimes um, insects they reproduce really 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 fast. They have lots of babies really quick, and then in like 
a month, an insect could be a great grandma. So wow. it, t it could go really fast. So they wouldn't take that long. It might not take very long. But humans, we take a little bit longer. So for us to see evolution, it uh, takes a while. So wow, it might be millions of years. Very interesting. Cool. And that was natural selection? Yeah. That's what that's called? Mm -hmm. Wow. I definitely didn't know about that before <laughs> at all. Well, thank you, Vanessa, for thank coming you. on and joining us. Would you please come back tomorrow and yes. join us here on the Couch Potato Lab? That's right. I'll actually be back tomorrow. So make sure you tune in tomorrow, and I'll be here. Ooh. Amazing. Thank you, Vanessa. Awesome. See you next time. Bye. Bye. <coughs> Amazing. All right. So we've been talking a lot about different animal adaptations, but now I would like to draw your attention to some plant adaptations with Ooh. this handy-dandy whiteboard. <laughs> Oh, there we go. All right. Love plants. So there are different types of plants, like some flowers, some plants have berries and fruits and some cool things like that. What kind of plant do you have there, Kat? So I just drew a basic plant because these are where my skill set lies in the <laughs> art uh, department. <laughs> so when we're looking at a plant, we have like three basic structures that help plants adapt to their environments to better survive. So we're looking at the ground. We have the roots and the roots offer plant support so that they can stay in the ground and not get maybe blown away in the wind or swept away in water. And the roots also help plants bring in water um, through the soil that they're in, which helps fuel the plant and help it grow. We also see that the plant has a stem and this stem offers the plant's support and strength. Um, and the final part, we have our leaves. And leaves help bring in food from the sun because they um, help go through photosynthesis in their leaves. Now, when we're looking at different plants, you know, sometimes we have plants in the ocean. And they are different than plants on land because plants in the ocean, they um, need to have a very um kind of noodle like stem so that when the currents are <laughs> you know moving these plants around like for example kelp that the plant is able to stay rooted in the ocean and we also see that plants in the ocean they like to grow up to the surface because what's at the surface the sun the sun the sun is at the surface and they need that sunlight to help grow and reproduce as well. And then if we think about trees, trees on the other hand have a very rigid, strong stem and very deep, strong roots. And that helps um, them not get blown away if we have very strong winds. Like for example, in Saskatchewan the past few days, <laughs> it has been very, very windy. <laughs> and you may even see some trees down. So that means that maybe those trees weren't strong enough to do that. And this leads us in to today's potato problem. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so today's potato problem, Kobe and Haley, should you choose to accept it? Oh, I yep. will accept it. Yes. Awesome. So <coughs> I will be giving each of you an environment for which you need to create a plant that would survive in that environment. Does that make sense? So they have to be adapt they have to adapt to the s random environment that you're gonna give us is that true yes okay and it's gonna be completely random and so <laughs> Haley, your environment that you need to create a plant for is in the ocean in a nice tropical ocean kind of you know around a coral reef okay i think i can do that all right and Kobe, yes. your environment is going to be in outer space. Outer space? Yes. <laughs> what? And that's not it. With porcupine needles Por flying around <laughs> in the environment. So you need to create a plant that will withstand that environment. <laughs> oh. All right. You okay. have a, how many minutes would you like on the clock? Maybe like three. <laughs> three minutes? Okay. And we would like you at home to, um, after we they finish their sketches and their drawings, we want your input from home. What do you think? Who made the plant with the best adaptations to their unique environments? <laughs> All right. 
We're ready? Yes. The time will start in three, two, one. Go. Go. Okay. Um, do I have to name my species? Hmm. Yes. We would like yes. a name for the species. Okay. Um, maybe a background, personal info about the plant. <laughs> Anything that you would like to add, because this is also not just a science problem, it is a pizzazz problem. Pizzazz to, problem? We want pizzazz in these answers. Okay, so why did you give me um, porcupine needles? Why do you think that was relevant? Well, <laughs> what episode was that, Kobe? Do you remember what episode we were together on? Uh, you were baby, the it's cold outside baby it's, it's cold, cold outside. outside that yeah. was right that was our last episode that you may have seen where kobe made me design <laughs> a um a suit a jacket and my <laughs> environment was what was it it was a light uh kind of windy day with some light rain with porcupine needles <laughs> shooting at me and i had to make a make a suit for that and so now is my time for a vengeance and I will make Kobe <laughs> have to design a plant a that will oh. <laughs> survive some pork pie needles. Now, okay. Haley, what are your thoughts going through your head making this plant to survive in a nice tropical ocean? Hmm. Well, I'm thinking when you say tropical and with coral, have you ever like scraped your foot on coral before? No, I've sadly never been in the ocean uh, in oh my life. So what? no. <laughs> we live so close to the ocean in Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. There is no ocean near Saskatchewan. But uh, corals, if you hit your foot on it or anything else, it scrapes you pretty easily. That's kind of one of their adaptations. And so I'm thinking if my plant's gonna be around that, I don't want them to get cut down and by this coral, right? So I'm trying to think of a defense mechanism to that sharp coral. Wow. Oh, wow. So Amazing. much thought involved. Holy. That's what we like to see. We like a good, solid thought <laughs> process. And don't forget to name your plant. And um, maybe you want to try this at home. Create your own environment that you will create a plant or maybe even an animal that will have special adaptations. Maybe you want an animal that will survive in a volcano. What kind of adaptations <laughs> would you give that animal to survive that? You can text us at 306-570-1013 or you can tweet at us using the hashtag CouchPotatoLab. Kobe. Yes. How is yours coming along? Mine is great. So the thing is, like, since it's in space, I have to worry about um, no gravity. That's one thing. <laughs> when in space, wh what if you're lost and you can't find the, find the sun? Oh, no, that's another problem. And I need to find, like, um, dirt, right? So I can stick onto the dirt and grow nice and great. So those are, like potential problems I have and the last problem is the porcupine needles so I don't know maybe do they have like do these porcupine needles just like fly directly at me do I have some kind of like um, smell that attracts these porcupine needles to me I don't know well I thought of something and I'm ready for that but I think what's really really funny <laughs> is that um, Haley actually made made up a really funny animal <laughs> from last episode. <laughs> Do you remember what it's called, Haley? <laughs> oh my goodness, was that the bear with the... <laughs> Is oh, it this did you one? say it? <laughs> this one? Is it this one? No, that one's Sabrina's. Okay, never mind. I think mine <laughs> might have met the garbage bin. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I was trying to make an animal. I wasn't, I wasn't clear on the instructions. I'm very clear now on the instructions, but I, I had made a bear that's sits on its on its butt all the time. <laughs> oh, nice. And had a beak. <laughs> so yes, it was uh, a beaked bear. That's what it was. All right, we'll give you 10 <laughs> more seconds. We'll count you down. 10, 9, 8, I'm 7, down. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time's up. All right. Who would like to reveal their plant first? Haley would like uh, to yes, reveal. Yes, I think I will. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so I've created, w let's have a reminder of what my setting was maybe. So Haley's setting was a nice tropical <coughs> ocean, nice warm waters right. <laughs> around a coral reef. And she needed to create a plant that would have great adaptations to survive here. All right, so you're thinking tropical, you're thinking Mexico, Hawaii. 
So I present to you the monster seaweed. <laughs> so this is this kind of looks like seaweed. But it's not just any seaweed. It is. It has spikes on it, <laughs> <laughs> and that is so that if it somehow hits the coral by accident, the spikes will kind of attack that coral, and it won't actually get hurt. Wow. Ooh. So yes, and it also has very strong roots because sometimes those currents can be very strong. So yeah, the roots are just very strong, and we have some spikes on it. Wow, the monster seaweed. Mm -hmm. Love very that. nicely done. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and now, as we get into Kobe's <laughs> reveal, we will <laughs> remind you that his environment was outer space <laughs> with porcupine needles <laughs> shooting at his plant all around. All right, oh Kobe. No. What plant did you come up with? Okay. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is the spacey, rady planty. Okay. Can you say that name again? Spacey Rady Planty. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the roots. The roots, these are radars. <laughs> so they kind of try to signal and find um, dirt, <laughs> any soil around. So, so like, oh, there's an incoming planet. Um, this um, radar um, root it will detect that and direct itself to that planet so it can anchor there and grow. Um, this ball right here is very, very important because we know that space has no gravity, right? Kind of you can like float around. So this is kind of like a like a ball that allows it to adjust its um, gravity, I guess. Kind of like a like a gas bladder that a fish has right to adjust to their buoyancy this one will allow it to like maybe it will surround itself with more gravity so it can direct itself straight to that planet and yeah good idea and the last thing is that this very very large leaf allows it to shield itself from the porcupine needles coming at it <laughs> <laughs> and has a sticky substance around this um, um leaf so it can just attach like uh, grab all the porcupine needles and then use that as its shield so it's like a double shield and ready for more incoming porcupine needles yes how do you like that cat wow <laughs> i mean i'm impressed i thought <laughs> i was i thought i was really gonna you know stick ya with that one but great adaptations to both Haley and kobe those were wonderful yeah. and now it is time for you to ask our scientists. So if you have any questions, you can text us 306-570-1013 or tweet them in at hashtag couch potato lab. <coughs> so our first question from Luke the Donut on Twitter. Luke is wondering, does anyone know how many types of adaptations there are? <gasps> there's so many. I think there's just too many of uh, that many different adaptations to count all of them. Hmm. Like, like for example, um, our fingers are kind of like adapted so that we're able to use it really well, right? Um, the webbing is cut. Like for example, like ducks, they have like visible webbing, webbing that they can use um, for like walking and stuff like that. But we don't have that, so our fingers are like um, adapted so that we can move them around and like play with rocks or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's too many. I don't know. Yeah, there's in a, in a broad example, <coughs> there's so many. But if we look down to the basics, if we could categorize the different types of adaptations. Haley, do you have an idea of how many there might be? <laughs> yes, I do. There's actually only three, Kobe. That's o it? Really? Only three. <laughs> oh, okay. And well. I'm going to be using the internet for some help for this. So the first one is behavioral adaptations. And that's where it's um, it helps to survive in the immediate environment. Uh, so that's the first one, behavioral. And then there is the uh, cycle. Oh, physiological. That's the word. Um, and it basically is a body process that helps an organism to survive. Kind of like our digestive system, maybe, is what I'm thinking of. How oh. it can break down the specific foods that we eat as humans. So, wait, would a behavioral example, would that be like, you know, when skunks feel threatened and then they lift their tail up hey. and like, pew, <laughs> like a super stinky fart? Yes. Would that be a behavioral response? Yes, I believe so. It would be, yes. Wow, okay. Yeah, so we have behavioral. We have uh, physiological, and then we have structural, and that is um, a feature that helps an organism's body to help survive and produce. So I guess maybe on your example, Kobe, what was it called? Your My plant. 
Yeah, so maybe mice. that was the the overhanging leaves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that may have helped to help it to survive because that's part of its body. Mm -hmm, exactly. All right, and we have another question here. Why do chipmunks hibernate when other squirrels don't? From the Hayes brothers. Would mm. anyone like to tackle this one? Why do chipmunks hibernate? Hmm. So chipmunks chipmunks only hibernate, but like the other squirrels don't. Is that the question? Well, yes, why do chipmunks hibernate when other squirrels don't? Oh. I don't know, like some some animals are adapted for the winter and some others aren't. So in order to compensate or like learn, f um, avoid that cold winter or the harsh winter, they have to kind of hibernate and kind of be in a state, like a state where they don't have to deal with all that crazy things. Or Haley, do you have any other idea? I do have another idea. Some more help from the internet here. And basically what I'm getting from this is that squirrels do more of, is it a, or is it chipmunks that do a fat storage? Hmm, Kat, maybe you can help me out with this. Yes, <coughs> so it looks like squirrels don't actually hibernate in winter, um, but they don't like how cold it is outside. Um, so in turn, they kind of stay hunkered down in a den when it's really cold, um, and they stay warm with their friends um, until they can venture out again. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Never knew that. I just assumed that most animals hibernated during the winter, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one more question here from Chloe. Chloe would like to know if we can share our plants so other kiddos can color them. Like Kobe's <laughs> wonderful <laughs> space plant. Yeah. I think, so. yes, yeah. we will. We'll post it on like yeah. maybe Facebook. I think that's probably best. Or our social media. And then we'll get you a cool coloring page ready so you can color my spacey rady planty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Now, thank you for tuning in today. We have very exciting news that this week we are going to have an eyes giveaway. That's right. So if you would like to participate in the giveaway, um, all you have to do is go back to episode five. And the question is, when eyes gives you lemons, what did Sabrina accidentally add to her lemonade? Ooh, Ooh, you'll have know. to go back watch episode five watch that episode um and let us know you can text us once again or tweet us your answer so uh that's texting us at 306-570-1013 or tweeting us at hashtag couch potato lab and this contest will close this thursday at 5 p.m so you've got all until then to get the right answer in and for example one of the prizes are this super cool <gasps> potato clock. Ooh. Oh my goodness, that looks super cool. What is a potato clock? Well, you'll have to win the prize to find <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's potato clock amongst other super awesome eye swag. Ooh, I want some. Yes. So thank you for joining us here today. If you would like to come back tomorrow, uh, just a reminder to go to bit.ly backslash couch potato lab to um, get ready for tomorrow's episode and find that lab manual. We'd like to thank you all for joining us and watching. Uh, we'll be back here all week indefinitely for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to our supporters, Actua, the University of Regina, Graffiti TV, and once again, you for watching at home. Thank you so much. Bye! Bye.